Hi, and welcome to this course that is called Design of Digital Circuits, a Systems Approach. This course is given at some of the engineering programs at the Faculty of Engineering at Lund University in Sweden. In this course, we are going to learn how to design and implement digital systems. From a problem description, we will learn how to build a working digital circuit that solves our problem. This is what we mean by a systems approach. The overall design of the system and an optimization of the involved functions will be at the center of our attention. We will, for example, not compare different types of flip-flops. We will not dig deep into the different uses of a full adder, but instead focus on its design. Though we will briefly discuss, for example, counters, we will not compare different counters to a larger extent. Neither will we dig deeper into the different types of memories. Instead, as a course for master students in engineering, we pay more attention to the mathematical foundations for our circuits and the functions that need to be realized in our circuits. In this introduction, we are going to define analog and digital signals and then motivate why digital circuits are useful and some of their limitations. Then we will give a short outline of the course content. Our digital systems will take a digital signal as input. This signal can define the behavior of a device, but it could also be manipulated and sent out as a new transformed signal. A signal is a function that conveys the behavior about some phenomenon and provides information about the status of some system. The signal is something that varies in time or space. The variation in time could be voltage, current or an electromagnetic field or atmospheric pressure. In the picture we see an example of a signal produced by a microphone. The voice creates variations in atmospheric pressure, which in turn produces a variation in the voltage. So the voltage here is a function of time. The difference between an analog and a digital signal is that the digital signal takes discrete values on the y-axis, while the analog signal takes continuous values. If we instead look at the time, that is the x-axis, the digital signal can take values in discrete time. These signals are then called synchronous signals. In this case, we often denote the time instances by an integer. So the time t is in the set of integers z. If the time is continuous, then the signals are called asynchronous signals. Conversions between analog and digital signals are performed using AD converters if we want to convert from an analog to digital signal and DA converters for converting from a digital to an analog signal. If we look at the AD converter, in this converter we sample the analog signal at specific time instances and record the sampled values using some discrete representation of the actual value. What we can see here is that we are potentially losing information in two different ways. First, since the signal must take discrete values on the y-axis, they are approximations of the real signal. This we solve by using a sufficient precision on this approximation so that this loss is not noticeable for the given application. The precision needed will however depend on the specific application. The second loss is that after we have sampled the signal, we do not know what happened between the two sample time instances. This we solve by sampling with enough rate so that the potential loss that we have will only be frequencies that we do not care about. To help us with this, we have the Nyquist-Shannon theorem, which we will return to very soon. Let us look at an example where we wish to record music to a CD. The analog sound signal is sampled at 44,100 Hz, that is, we record the signal value 44,100 times per second. To describe the sample values, 16 bits are used, which is 2 bytes. In comparison, a Blu-ray disc supports up to 24 bits for describing the sample. This means that we can record about 65,000 different values, even though the actual value is continuous and can take virtually an infinite number of different values. We need to do this both for the left and the right channel since we want stereo sound and also it has been decided that a CD should be able to hold 74 minutes of music. We can easily calculate that the data that we must be able to store on a CD is 740 megabytes. A typical CD-ROM for storing data is somewhat less than this and that is because data needs some additional redundancy for error detection and correction. 
The Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem is a fundamental bridge between continuous time and discrete time signals. It says that a continuous time signal of finite bandwidth can be exactly represented by a sequence of samples. More specifically, it says how fast we have to sample a signal in order not to lose the information. The theorem is stated as follows. If a function contains no frequencies higher than b hertz, then it is completely determined by giving its ordinates or its values at a series of points spaced 1 over 2b seconds apart. So the interpretation of this is that we need to sample at at least 2b samples per second in order not to lose any information in frequencies up to b hertz. If we look at our example with the CD, we take 44,100 samples per second, which means that we can exactly represent all frequencies up to about 22,000 Hz. The hearing range for humans is roughly between 20 and 20,000 Hz, which means that we need a sample rate of about 40,000 Hz. We will then lose information in the frequencies higher than 22,000, but we cannot hear them anyway. The reason the sample rate is slightly higher than 40,000 Hz is that filters are not perfect and we will attenuate also signals that pass the filter that are close to the cutoff frequency. But those details are more suitable for a course in digital signal processing. So why are we interested in digital signals? An important reason is that the digital bitstream that represents the signal gives us many opportunities to do computations on the signal. First, we can process and communicate the signal without any errors or noise added to it. This can be achieved by adding redundancy and is called channel coding. Second, we can compress the data so that it occupies less space when stored and requires less bandwidth when it is communicated. This can be done in a lossy or lossless fashion. For lossless coding, the goal is to minimize the redundancy of the bitstream by representing common patterns by something that is more compact. In the lossy case, information that only slightly impacts the destination's interpretation of the signal is removed. Continuing the music example, MP3 encoding uses the frequency domain of the signal in order to remove or do approximations for frequencies that the human ear is less sensitive to. Obviously such compression is also followed by lossless compression in order to further reduce the size of the resulting file. A third application is encryption where the data is scrambled to a cryptotext by applying a function taking the data and the cryptographic key as input. Only with access to the corresponding decryption key it will be possible to get the original data or the plain text back. We can also rather easily operate on and manipulate the digital signals, for example by applying filters or by adding effects in the case of sound. Another reason why digital signals are attractive is that the digital electronics are today very cheap. We can add all the things we listed here and still not pay very much for the equipment needed. As an example, a modern processor has several billion transistors, but it still costs only around $100. And the price per transistor is decreasing every year. We could also ask ourselves the question why we need analog if digital has so many advantages. One reason is that the world is analog. The zeros and ones that we are using in digital systems are made up. What is happening around us is actually analog. Both air pressure, voltage levels, current and the polarization of magnets is analog. Digital circuits are constructed by using analog circuits and digital transmission is realized by using analog signals. We just interpret the received signal as digital. In this course the goal is to understand how to build circuits that take a sequence of discrete values as input and outputs a sequence of discrete values. Thus we are going to build the digital system here in the picture. Sometimes the input, if it is analog, will first go through an AD converter, while in other cases it is going to be taken from the output of another digital system and then the signal will be digital from the beginning. Since we are only focusing on the digital system, these two situations will be treated in the same way. The actual conversion between digital and analog will not be considered in this course. Here is a brief outline of the course. It is divided into 14 parts. The first three parts will focus on state transition graphs, 
how to describe our problem using such graphs and how to realize the graphs using gates. This will give you a complete overview of our goal of going from a problem description to a digital circuit. In parts 4 to 6 we will take a look at the mathematical foundations for our realization. We will go from abstract algebra all the way to how we can write and represent our boolean functions in different ways. Then in parts 7 to 10 we will focus on how our involved functions and graphs can be minimized. This allows us to build smaller and more efficient circuits. Up until this point we have primarily focused on synchronous circuits. In part 11 we will instead discuss how asynchronous circuits can be realized and under what circumstances they can be realized. In part 12 we will discuss some common digital components and also give a short introduction to the CMOS technology that can be used to build our circuits from transistors. The final parts, 13 to 14, will focus on linear circuits. The linearity allows us to handle and minimize such circuits in a more mathematically elegant way compared to the nonlinear circuits that have been considered in the rest of the course. And with this short overview, I again welcome you to the course and I hope it will be a positive learning experience. Let's start!